heard um, just because I think the presentations today are going to have some great content and you know to be able to share that when uh, we have a chance to so um, would you like to uh, start us off with a welcome yeah I'd be glad to uh, really appreciate everyone giving uh, some time today to uh, get on a webinar for uh, the Next Generation Leadership Institute. Um, I think everyone on the Zoom today is familiar with uh, the NGLI, but maybe just a couple of words about uh, this uh, program and the National Conservation Foundation. Um, so uh, about two years ago, uh, the National Conservation Foundation uh, began identifying the need uh, to begin a leadership program uh, for up-and-coming emerging leaders within the conservation community um, and began laying the groundwork for uh, what has become today the Next Generation Leadership Institute. And uh, we're very excited that we've got a uh, group of seven uh, up-and-coming leaders within uh, the conservation district community. Um, the uh, original design for this session was to have a policy focused uh, leadership uh, session in Washington DC back in March and um, unfortunately around the time that uh, we had originally scheduled this it was going to be in conjunction with uh, the National Association of Conservation Districts legislative Club, which was uh, scheduled for um, March the 23rd that was about two weeks before uh, the uh, District of Columbia completely closed down and so we had to scramble quickly uh, to make uh, alternative plans to cancel the face-to-face -face meetings that we uh, had and also to uh, reschedule uh, things for a virtual environment which I know everyone on the zoom today has uh, probably become very adept and skilled at doing uh, so we we transitioned our legislative fly-in to a virtual fly-in and uh, visited with legislature with, with members of the legislature's uh, offices uh, the the week following uh, the, the original plan and uh, we also began working on identifying an opportunity to also hold the uh, second session of the next generation leadership institute uh, which we are very fortunate to be able to do today. I'm very grateful uh, for uh, all of the uh, presenters that have made time within their schedule uh, to participate today. Uh, and just looking at uh, the lineup that we have, we, we really have a good uh, diversity of viewpoints, uh, both from within the federal government, um, as well as from within organizations that uh, do very critical work in Washington, D.C., uh, on policy, on government affairs, uh, representing uh, various constituencies, various perspectives that are all important uh, to uh, agriculture, to conservation, uh, to uh, rural and, and urban communities all across the country. Uh, so just wanted to say a few remarks uh, today to welcome folks. Uh, very uh, glad that we have been able to, to persevere and, and to make this session occur. Um, and uh, again, thanks uh, to everyone for giving of your time today and uh, for joining uh, the webinar. Uh, so, uh, Sunny, I think I'll stop there and uh, look forward uh, to the uh, rest of the webinar. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, you know, our goal for today is to be able to take a little bit more of a deep dive into um, the topic of the policy work of some of um, the folks that we were going to be hearing from during the spring season. Um, and um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, have um, a round of self introductions. We'll go ahead and start with our um, speakers. I'll call out your name, have you introduce yourself, your title, affiliation, um, and then I'll go through our cohort members as well. So, um, Ms. would you like? Us off. All right, Sonny, I lost, uh, you broke up just a bit for, on my end, um, but I can go ahead if you'd like, um, or anybody else. 
Sure. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll call names and if you can introduce yourself, that would be great. Um, go ahead. We'll go ahead and start with this presentation. Thank you for letting me know about the freeze. Um, uh, Kevin Norton, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Certainly. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kevin Norton, the Associate Chief with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, senior, it is the senior career uh, position in the agency. Uh, reporting directly to uh, Chief Matt Laurie, who y'all met out in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, uh, been with the agency 38 years, and I'll share a little bit more when I get into my presentation. Uh, glad to be with y'all today. Thank you, Kevin. Jenny? Jenny Mesro, I'm Vice President of Government Affairs at the Farm Credit Council. Uh, we represent the um, institutions of the farm credit system across the country. And I, Matt Lohr, used to be a farm credit folk as well. So I know Matt really well and he's great to work with. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Ryan. Hi, all. I'm Ryan Richards. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center for American Progress. Uh, I'm on the public lands team, but I also work on um, agriculture and, and environmental policy on, on private lands for us. And I'll talk a little bit more about the work we do in the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Coleman? Hey, I'm Coleman Garrison, the Director of Government Affairs for NACE. Uh, I've met several of y'all on the NGLI cohort through various NACD activities, but uh, so some of y'all probably know a little bit what I do or get my email updates or blog posts, but looking forward to chatting with y'all later. Thanks, Coleman. And we also have Mary Scott with us. I'm gonna have you introduce yourself, Mary. So I'm Mary Scott. Um, I am the Natural Resource Policy Specialist for NACD, and I started with NACD about three months ago, um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you and working with all of you in the future. Thanks, Mary. Okay, so with that, we'll start with the uh, cohort members, and I've got Bar Barbara at the top of my screen. Me. It's me. It's always uh, yeah. good to be with a B because everyone starts alphabetically, right. and I'm usually right up there. And <laughs> nice to meet you, Ryan. My daughter's here with me. She came down. She works with Shelf, she's been on Zoom meetings all day with you guys. Uh, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, actually transplanted down from uh, Northern Virginia in 2013. And so for Kevin, I'll date myself. So I used to call on ag when I was with um, SAP and Oracle. I called on the Soil Conservation Service and ASCS. I don't think those groups exist anymore, but I think uh, Soil Conservation Service became NRCS. But I'm dating myself. Nobody else has heard of these except me. Um, and anyway, I'm here a supervisor for Mecklenburg Soil and Water Conservation District and getting extremely interested in urban agriculture and learning from all my fellow cohorts and they're a fantastic group. So I'm looking forward to hearing more. Okay, thanks Barbara. And Joe, I've got you next. Sure, thanks Sonny. Uh, Joe Coughlin here from Northern Oklahoma, uh, farmer rancher uh, on the local K County Conservation District Board and uh, also serve on, at the State Association as a vice president. Uh, very much enjoying the NGLI inaugural year, and uh, just appreciate all you all being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay, Phil's next. Good morning. Hi, Phil Campbell here, Oklahoma County Conservation District, also on the state board at one of five the commissioners of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we've got a small uh, Angus herd that uh, we raised here. Um, this has been a tremendous program and thank you to each and every one of the presenters for uh, taking the time out to be here today. And uh, hats off to uh, the dynamic duo is what I call them. And thank you for uh, keeping us all together and uh, looking forward to the session. Hopefully that went through. Yep, it did. I heard you loud and clear. Thanks very much, Phil. Okay, how about you, Samantha? Oh, where'd I go? You're, I, can, I can hear you. Oh. 
Okay, Sam Steiner, I'm from uh, Southwestern Ohio. I serve on the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District Board and also am an area director for the state. Um, I raise beef cattle, chickens, and turkeys, um, and just been uh, trying to keep people fed around here and uh, staying busy with that and looking forward to this presentation. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Sam. How about you, Cassius? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Cassius Spears, Sr. Uh, I, um, I'm a member of a federal recognized tribe here in the great state of Rhode Island, uh, Narragansett tribe. Um, I also sit on uh, the uh, National Tribal uh, Policy Group. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the uh, president of the, the state uh, association and also uh, vice on the uh, uh, Southern District uh, Conservation uh, but um, but yeah, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I really look forward to listening uh, to the to the to speakers today. Thank you. Thanks, Cassius. Ryan, uh, I can see you. You're multitasking, um, but I know how people you are, so I'm going to go with you. <laughs> All right. If you can hear me, I I apologize. I promise I'm headed back to the office. Had to make a quick parts run. Uh, we've been okay. pumping storm water and. And doing all kinds of fun things but um but yeah my name is ryan Britt. i serve on the randolph county soil and water district board in north central missouri and also serve as the president of the missouri association of soil and water conservation districts and very much have enjoyed our um, time on the leadership institute and and the brief time that it has been so far but uh very much appreciate the work that sunny and and, and everyone has done and uh, I am looking forward to the presentation today. And I will get back to the office and try not to make so much noise, I apologize. <laughs> okay, drive safe. Um, and we also have Mark Masters, I can see you're on. Yeah, hey, hey, Sonny. Um, I'm, I didn't turn my video on, I didn't want to make, make anybody jealous. I'm multitasking too, I'm just, you know, <laughs> looking at the beautiful waters of the Gulf of Mexico, sitting <laughs> on the beach. Uh, we, we all needed a change of scenery, so. Um, yeah, I may I may join the join my video later, but um, appreciate the chance to be on as always. Thanks for you, especially Sonny, you and Ray for putting all this together. Um, I'm Mark Masters with the Lower Chattahoochee Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, that's down in Southwest Georgia. Uh, my family and I raise beef cows and, and a few other things. Um, local supervisor there, also on the state board uh, for the Georgia Association of Conservation Districts. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm director of the Georgia Water Policy Center and have been fortunate enough to work with uh, a number of folks uh, on this call with, with NACD and, and NRCS and various research and outreach uh, programs over the years. So happy to be here and, and looking forward to it. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. And of course, as always, you've got Ray Ledgerwood and me, Sunny Heike Snapton and Washington, Montana. So. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So we do have um, our speakers um, using some PowerPoint presentations. So that will be one of the screen share uh, transitions that you'll see um, for the speakers. I'll send you, send you a quick uh, chat message when you're five minutes or so towards the end. So um, we're on time and we've got Kevin Norton starting up. Ray, if you can stop your share screen and then Kevin can um, engage his. And I'll go ahead and mute me and y'all might want to do the same. Sonny, can you tell me when it's displayed for everyone? It looks great. Okay, wonderful. I'll get started. Well, uh, it's really quite an honor uh, to be with y'all today. And I, and I want to share a little bit of background from me. Uh, I am uh, uh, from Oklahoma originally. I was born and raised in the southwestern part of the state on a, a, a very uh, diverse agricultural operation of peanuts, cotton, uh, watermelons, milo, wheat, and uh, and then we baled hay and, and had Angus uh, purebred cattle. So that's the world I grew up in, uh, raised show pigs uh, because I couldn't afford 
uh, to keep myself in the uh, show steer business with the price that things were. Uh, but I did come from an agriculture background and, uh, and really cut my teeth across the western part of Oklahoma. I, I was uh, uh, hired on by the Soil Conservation Service and been proudly served with them for 13 years before we transitioned to the Natural Resources Conservation Service to better reflect that broad uh, group of or that broad base of conservation work that we do that is very much beyond uh, the the work of the uh, uh, just soil erosion and I'm having trouble getting my PowerPoint to advance. Uh, I'm gonna reshare it here and see if we can get this thing to work. There we go. Now let's see if it'll advance. There we go. Uh, Y'all, uh, uh, and, and to go beyond that, whenever I started with the Natural Resources or the Soil Conservation Service, I, I want to take y'all back to your positions. Uh, I started in the Comanche County, Oklahoma field office with the Soil and Water Conservation District Board, and they were, they were very active. And, and whenever I sat down at their board meeting as a range conservationist, and I provided the conservation plans that I've been working on that past month. They really drilled into me around what I was seeing on the land, what the individual's goals were, the kind of things that helped shape the way they wanted to provide service to their customers, uh, our customers, and how we wanted to move conservation forward in Comanche County. As I moved uh, to Harper County in far northwest Oklahoma, uh, as you get out towards the panhandle, really the heart of the Dust Bowl, again, a very active, a very aggressive uh, conservation district, providing services to that local community. I went from a very large urban uh, centric uh, with uh, folks that were connected, uh, not only to the farm, but to uh, the community of Lawton, to a very rural uh, 3,000 people in the whole county. Uh, you really could know almost every farmer, rancher that you work with in that part of Oklahoma. So districts have been formative to me. And then when I moved on through my career, always maintained connectivity to those soil and water conservation districts in the western third of Oklahoma that I worked with. And then uh, with the state uh, leadership, both the state association and the state commission. Uh, I was a part of the NRCS team attached to the inaugural leadership class uh, for conservation district supervisors there in Oklahoma and carried through to the next two classes after that. So uh, just a great experience. And, you know, I am probably uh, a reflection of my experience and time working with soil and water conservation districts. And I just want to let y'all know you're important. Uh, you're very much a part of uh, the success of, uh, of the conservation partnership across this great landscape of America and uh, your value uh, to helping us move our local, uh, our folks forward at the local level and delivering uh, the, the important conservation services is critical. Uh, as y'all met uh, Chief Lohr, you realize that he has, uh, or you know that he has uh, re done our mission and vision. It was a team effort. He shared that at NACD meeting, and I've just put it up here as a reminder of the broad amount of conservation work that we pay attention to day in and day out. And truly, there is no place in the United States of America that we are not important. Uh, when it comes to private lands conservation, uh, our mission, our vision, and that shared uh, leadership that we have with soil and water conservation districts is critical to the success. Uh, just from a policy perspective, uh, I just wanted to share with you the leadership of our agency. Um, I can pitch this uh, PowerPoint presentation on to Sunny and she can share it back with you. Uh, but our structure pretty much is the chief is the head of the agency. Uh, 
then I'm the associate chief uh, and beneath me, all of the deputy chiefs for science and technology programs, management strategy, our administrative unit, and then soil science and resource assessment. They all report to me as, we, as I work to, to maintain the overall technical and programmatic and administrative uh, parts of the agency. The chief, uh, the regional conservationists that work with your state conservationists uh, all report directly to the chief and it's a clear line of sight from that field office all the way up through the state office uh, to the chief. So that's kind of our structure at the national level. You will are more than likely and more times than not will engage directly with our state conservationists and the chief is very focused on us having a, a strong partnership uh, building relationships uh, at the local and state level, and and you, and with those relationships, learning, uh, partnering, and teaming together for successful conservation delivery at the local level to our broad customer base. Uh, we're located, as you're well aware, uh, over 3,100 field offices and locations across the country. Uh, we have 25 plant material centers, and then. Uh, we have our technical centers, and uh, and and all of this is is built to support what y'all are doing out at the local soil and water conservation district level, our local field offices. I continue to remind the leadership here in Washington D.C. that we only have a job if they're successful in the field. Everything that we're funded to do has a direct connection to a local. A uh, field office, uh, a local watershed, uh, you know, plant materials development in a regional level, soil surveys at the county, uh, major land resource area, everything all works its way down to our measurables or what we're getting done in the field. So it's really important that we uh, keep our focus on uh, moving conservation forward at the local level and it all happens through soil and water conservation districts and that relationship at the local level. Uh, the birth, you know, we, we, we were established in 1935. The birth of our agency uh, was not the, the big show it is today because we were just absolutely not as effective as we should be. And our chief, Hugh Hammond Bennett, uh, worked with the Secretary of Agriculture and the President of the United States and they shipped out the Model Soil Conservation District Law in 1937, two years after we were uh, established as a Soil Conservation Service. Through that local leadership, that local connectivity, we began to connect with the local resource issues and have a program that was reflective of what was necessary. You know, what works in North Carolina will not work in Oklahoma. You know, I'm familiar with both of the soil and water conservation districts, my friends from Oklahoma, and definitely North Carolina looks nothing like the central uh, plains of Oklahoma and right on that transition line between the high, the, the high plains and the prairies and the cross timbers and the forested regions of Oklahoma. But local officials helping us direct our conservation movement. Uh, we, our employees, are trained technical specialists. They're very, uh, they're very knowledgeable in the sciences. Uh, sometimes, as we're finding today, they're not as connected to agriculture as maybe I was whenever I came into the agency, uh, straight from the farm, college, and into the agency. Uh, but uh, our folks know conservation, they know soil and water conservation, and they're there uh, to grow within that community and to provide that assistance to the folks there on the ground. We have a suite of programs, over 30 programs, and they're, they're in two buckets. Uh, one is discretionary programs. That means they're appropriated annually. Congress has to take specific action to put money into these programs and to keep them moving forward. I've highlighted the, the green ones there are our organic programs. They have been with us since the very foundation of the agency. Conservation technical assistance to private landowners, our plant materials program, putting the right conservation plants in place to cover and to address the wind and, er and water erosion issues of the day. And to actually, you know, not just to set it aside 
uh, like the CRP does, but those plant materials also were built to provide a functional agriculture purpose beyond the conservation purpose. And so they were tied to grazing resources, shifting crop production to grazing lands, or treating, uh, stabilizing gullies, uh, doing those kinds of things. And then our soil survey, which is the foundation that we build all of our conservation planning activity on. Over time, these programs have grown. We have a number of discretionary programs. You'll see there uh, the watershed and flood prevention program districts are by and large uh, out of 30, uh, 20 something thousand structures, they probably are the local sponsor on 90% of them. Uh, we have some that are not uh, directly connected to soil and water conservation districts, but by and large, uh, they are our number one sponsor for our watershed uh, works of improvement. And then you can see the other programs that have come along. One of them, uh, I'm sorry, Barbara, <laughs> that has not got added to this list, is the Office of Urban Agriculture. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I do apologize for that, but uh, it is a new discretionary program. Uh, it surprised a lot of people that it ended up in NRCS, even the uh, authorizers on the Hill was like, how did y'all get this? And it's like, we showed up, talked about all the things that were going on around the country in urban conservation. And the deputy said, sounds like it belongs to NRCS, but I want y'all to make it a department-wide effort. You don't own this program, you're, you're, you're a steward for the rest of the department. So uh, we'll get to that uh, uh, probably with your questions. Then we come to uh, the Farm Bill. The, 19, or the 1985 Farm Bill was the first Farm Bill that carried a solid conservation title with it. Uh, it really only authorized the conservation reserve program as the only cost share program uh, that was in that, but it did establish the compliance provisions and the wetland, uh, con con the wetland compliance provisions that we still deal with today in terms of eligibility for programs. But by 1990, it started transitioning into a broader suite of conservation programs. 1996 was the big change uh, with uh, uh, consolidating the Great Plains Conservation Program, Agriculture uh, Conservation Program, ACP. Those old, uh, and Barbara probably remembers those from her time in dealing with us. Uh, there was a whole different set of acronyms we dealt with, but 1996 tra transitioned us to the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, Farm and Ranch Land Protection Program, uh, Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, Wetland Reserve Program, a whole different suite of programs. But they come through the Farm Bill. We have seen the conservation component of the Farm Bill grow. It still is dwarfed by the nutrition title. But if you look at this slide, you see that conservation and commodities carry about the same weight uh, in, uh, in the author authorization of the Farm Bill. Now, commodities with uh, market facilitation payments, CFAP and some of those other things, you're gonna see that grow, uh, but we still are a major component of the funding that is de delivered through the Farm Bill. So we have about 7% of the total of 428 billion in outlays. Uh, these are the programs that y'all are familiar with. You hear about them around your conservation district table. Um, we are, are busy. Uh, as y'all are aware, the, the bill was passed in 2018. Uh, December of 2018, we spent last year rolling out uh, the interim rules. Uh, we're allowed by law to bypass the proposed rules and to move forward with the interim rules. So uh, we're now uh, taking all the comments that we received and we're building out the final rules. All this time, we're still allowed to implement the programs and that's what's going on. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about COVID and uh, where we're at and the changes that it has made to our agency. And I think y'all are all too familiar with them. Uh, but uh, essentially we, uh, we kind of closed up our operations for public access. We limit the number of folks in the office. Originally the discussion was just one person per office, uh, but we, you know, social distancing is the key and uh, we are allowing uh, our people to be there as long as they can stay six feet apart if they've got individual office space. Uh, so we allow the district conservationists to make some judgments around that in, co in coordination with the state conservationists. Uh, we've seen districts that have closed up because the state uh, mandated that all state and sub-state units you know, stay home. So uh, that's just a part of the partnership. Uh, you know, y'all are, a 
Uh, Y'all are con more connected to state government and that's the strength of our partnership is we have that local state and federal partnership. Uh, but we have flexed and tried to adapt across the way, but we still have to maintain the health and safety of all of our employees together. And so the social distancing has been the driver of that. We've been able to get to the field. We've been able to work with people. Uh, I think what we're gonna see as a change is this very thing right here. Uh, we are going to be doing more of this face-to-face -face kind of interaction, but it's gonna be through a computer screen or a TV monitor or something of that nature, uh, which will allow us to be more efficient. I think uh, when you're not having to spend all the time traveling uh, from one location to another, and you can have a quality meeting, and we are getting uh, some really good interaction with our meetings that we're having. So I think this is a change. Uh, we're gonna see technology move forward. It, it literally, this stuff has been available to us for a long time, but we've honed it now to a skill and the fear of using it has kind of, kind of gone away. Um, I think we're gonna see our, our interaction with our producers change a little bit. Uh, we will never be able to replace what you see in that left-hand corner or even the upper right-hand corner where we're face-to-face -face with a producer on their property. That's still critical, but we should never uh, walk away from that original foundation of putting technical people in the field with an agriculture producer on their field, their farm, and it becoming the major classroom for how to advance conservation and agriculture productivity. So that won't change, but how we get there sometimes may. We have got some really neat things that have happened with our servicing our programs, doing it by phone, Producer saying, I don't, have a, I don't have an email account. Well, does your wife have an email account? Or does your husband have an email account? Yeah, can we shoot this to them? Oh yeah, you can do that. And then we get it all taken care of and it comes back. Uh, the, you know, they say, well, neither one of them, the, 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 neither of the spouses have an account. Well, what about your kids? Oh yeah, can we send stuff to them? Oh yeah. So we're able to keep things moving. It's just getting past that saying, okay, uh, you can't do it, so we can't help you. It's trying to find that path forward to success, and I think that's been good. Um, the, the, the change we made between toolkit and conservation desktop, I know y'all have probably heard a lot about it, uh, but I will tell you in the old framework, and I was on with a, a bunch of field office people from uh, Nebraska yesterday, and literally if we had been in the old environment, we would not be able to service anyone right now. Our computers, uh, the telecommunication lines, uh, what's happening uh, there with Phil, uh, we would not be able to get things across the finish line. So I think we see that, you know, we bought a lot of surveying equipment that's single person, oh, what a, what a blessing. I mean, one person can go to the field and survey and get the field work done. Uh, because we couldn't put two people in a vehicle and they both feel safe. So we've just had a lot of challenges, but it's just been uh, phenomenal how folks out there at the local level have stepped up. Even situations where we got an NRCS vehicle going here, and then here comes a district person in their own vehicle meeting the person and they're doing the surveying work out in the field. Just a true team effort, a lot of success. And then the final thing, and, and I know I'm run, I've ran out of time, uh, but we have had issues with uh, you know, the impacts on the supply uh, uh, stream for our meat and poultry products. And uh, being able to take the program like Equip that has some broad authorities and provide some help to producers that are in a very bad situation. And there is not a single person that we're dealing with in this idea of, uh, of addressing carcass disposal and depopulation. There's no one wants this as their option. It is not where they want to be. And in the, in the darkest of days as a producer, when you're having to look at, at, at animals that you have brought to this point and there's nowhere to go with them, to be in this position that we can offer at that local level, a little bit of assistance. It does not near cover the cost of what the, they're dealing with, but we can offer them a little bit of assistance to help them get through this time and hopefully uh, maintain their operation and continue production in the future. 
So with that, I'll kind of wrap up. Uh, as uh, y'all are aware, uh, FSA has rolled out their Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, CFAP, and we're continuing to, to put that out there so uh, folks are aware that now's the time for them to call their local farm service agency office, even if you've never been a traditional producer uh, that is connected with FSA and their program offerings, now's the time to reach out and visit with them about whether this program can help you through this difficult time. With that, I'll uh, conclude and thank you very much with this final thing. We are all partners in conservation and I believe it, I really do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin. We probably have time for a question if anybody would like to ask one. Or maybe we can uh, go through that at the uh, at the end if folks want to just kind of noodle on it for a little bit. Um, all right, Jenny Mazzarell, um, we have an ability to share your screen as well. I do. I might um, go ahead. I might talk for a few minutes and then share. Just I don't have a formal PowerPoint for you all this morning um, or this afternoon but I, I do have a couple of things to share with you. So I'll just get started by introducing myself again, Jenny Mezra with the Farm Credit Council. Um, we are the National Trade Association for all of the 72 institutions that make up the farm credit system. They are all over the country, um, all over the 50 United States and Puerto Rico. We were established in 1916 to be a dedicated lender to farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Um, and we've been um, servicing that mission for over 100 years now. And we're really proud of the work that we do, um, both with you know, the large producers, small producers, and everybody in between, as well as rural electric, rural water, and um, rural telecom providers. So um, you know, we have customers, everyone from you know, feedlots and cattlemen to 10,000 acres of corn and soybeans in the middle of the country, to um, an operation that grows micro lettuces on rooftops in Brooklyn. So we, le we lend to everybody. Um, I've been with Farm Credit now nine years. I, before that I did um, rural and agriculture policy work um, on the Hill. So not a farm kid, I'm from South Florida, but um, have been in the agriculture space for 15 years now and enjoy every minute of it. Normally, in a presentation like this, and what I plan to do with y'all in March was a little bit more of a political update, um, but I thought what's obviously more pressing and probably more interesting at this point is what we've seen, both the shifting in what we do um, on, the, on the lobbying front and um, the government affairs front, as well as sort of our customers and what they're experiencing and how they're shifting and adapting. So um, as a trade association, our job is to represent both farm credit institutions and therefore our customers because each farm credit institution is a co-op, so they're owned and operated by their, their customers um, before Congress and the administration. So my job is to make sure members of Congress, their staff, members of the administration, and other trade groups like Farm Bureau, et cetera, understand um, the unique you know, opportunities and challenges facing not just farm credit institutions, but the customers we serve. So around this time, generally we, as crazy as this sounds, we would be talking about, um, you know, what makes sense, what producers are starting to need and see in regards to the farm bill. Even though the next farm bill process, um, the next farm bill won't pass until hopefully 2023, the process begins fairly early. Um, so we were starting to put together our strategy for, you know, what we would be looking for in the next farm bill. When the pandemic hit, everything went out the window. Congress obviously shifted everything that they were doing, and therefore the priorities of farm credit and what we needed to do to um, represent ourselves and our customers changed dramatically. Um, you know, the first thing we did was you know, all of our farm credit institutions assessed the situation and started to communicate immediately with their customers about what we could do to help. So how do you work with customers on an individual level um, uh, from a loan perspective to give them flexibilities to continue to operate? So, you know, re-amortizing loans, rolling short-term debt into long-term debt, um, 
interest only payments for a while, you know, those sorts of things, really working with customers to shore up their operations. From there, it was about understanding the federal programs and working with Congress to help them understand the needs of agriculture so that the federal programs that were being rolled out really, really quickly um, made sense. And at first, I'm sure some of you know, um, it, it took a little while, there were some kinks. So um, we spent an enormous amount of time in April and May figuring out the PPP loan program. And, um, you know, farm credit, ha we're not, we, we work a ton with FSA and NRCS and, um, you know, the B and I loans through USDA, but we don't have any experience really with SBA because there's not a ton of agriculture lending going through the Small Business Administration. So helping SBA understand the uniqueness of farm credit, our customers, the types of loans that they need, um, and how their operations and their employee structure may be different than your traditional small business. So that was um, a lot of communication, a lot of education, a lot of hurdles to overcome. But um, both with the cooperation of SBA and their staff, our staff, and Congress making some tweaks in the second round of the, um, the COVID relief bills, we were able to make some changes that made the PPP program and, and EIDL eventually more work better for agriculture. The other thing that we've been experiencing is, you know, obviously agriculture, no matter what part of the industry you're in, to some extent, is experiencing immense challenges right now. And we were getting a ton of questions from the Hill from folks who, you know, they understand that a tomato isn't grown in the grocery store. But there's not a ton of knowledge about how the tomato gets from the farm gate to the grocery store or to the restaurant. So there is this sort of education gap because folks never really had to think about it before. Um, so we thought, okay, how can we educate people in a really honest way that lets them ask really basic questions um, from producers themselves? So we shifted from, you know, in-person lobbying on the Hill to bringing the voices of our customers to members of Congress and their staff, to the administration, um, and to, you know, the media in a virtual platform. So we've created a series of virtual panel discussions that feature um, an industry expert, as well as, you know, as several farm credit customers. And the conversation, it's really about the basic understandings of how food is grown um, and, and then how, you know, how that interacts with the food supply chain, both in the United States and across the world. Uh, we started the conversation with livestock producers because the media, there was just so much information, both true and false, floating around out there about, you know, what was going on in the cattle industry, what was going on in pork, what was going on in poultry. The euthanation, euthanization of animals obviously was um, sensational news. So we wanted to help people understand why farmers would have to do that and explain to them, you know, while... You're, the price of meat may be going up in the stores, or you may not be able to get pork. They didn't understand why a producer would then be euthanizing animals if they couldn't find pork in their grocery stores. So helping folks understand the supply chain, why producer, you know, what the processing needs are, how to keep um, workers safe in processing facilities, what, what people needed to do on their farms to keep employees safe, and walking the media and folks through that process. So we did it um, again with specialty crops and I'll kind of show you what that looked like. So this is, this is what our panel looked like, um, specialty crops. And you know, we called it fruits and vegetables because at a very basic level, a lot of members of the media and frankly, a lot of folks on the Hill don't know what a specialty crop is. So we wanted to help them understand you know, specialty crops and then you know, fruits and vegetables and that they're the same thing and really walk folks through the challenges in the specialty crop world and why a you know producer may be you know disking under hundreds of acres of fresh vegetables because of either labor shortages or um, you know packing facilities not being able to have the same amount of employees as they normally would um, for safety reasons and how that all again impacts the the food supply chain and that 
while you, again, may be paying for more at the grocery store, American farmers and ranchers are not getting rich because of that. They are truly struggling. And educating folks about what that struggle looks like, and hopefully through that educational process, helping the Hill and the administration and USDA and others and the media understand how they may, um, how they may help producers as we continue to navigate, you know, both the, you know, this pandemic and the recovery from this pandemic, because the impacts on agriculture and the food supply chain, I think we're learning more and more every day, are going to last at least for months, if not maybe for years. And our job has really shifted from a purely, you know, lobbying perspective into a real educational role and helping folks understand um, the challenges that are out there and, and hopefully setting up some future conversations for future legislation of additional assistance for agriculture producers. So with that, um, you know, that, that's sort of the setup of, of what we're working on. I'm happy to take questions or take questions at the end. I'm also happy to talk to you about the election. I've, you know, we're the hybrid of policy and politics. So I, you know, if you've got election questions or things that I normally would have talked to you about, happy to have that conversation. I just thought, you know, with the timing and what was going on, how we're educating people and the challenges that are out there is, was more important. Yeah, excellent, Jenny. Are there any questions for Jenny on this? Or should we, should we dive into a little bit of the, uh, uh, the election topic? Actually, Jay, so this is Barbara. Um, you mentioned you so you were educating with this with these this panel of experts, elected officials. Did I understand that right? Oops, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Jenny, I think you're Barbara, I can hear you, but I think Jenny might have frozen. Yeah. Should I repeat the question? I think her froze. Oh, Whoops. There we go. She's unshared. Jenny, are you live there? Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead and repeat your question, Barbara. My question, Jenny, was uh, when you conducted this panel of explaining the supply chain and so forth, this, these were two elected officials uh, on the Hill or their staff. Did I understand that correctly? Elected, yes. So members of Congress, their staff, we had a bunch of USDA folks uh, sign in. For these, uh, the interest has been actually really encouraging. We've had over 300 people dial in for these and stay on for the duration of the conversation. So we feel like as long as people are interested in the in the content, we'll continue to do them. So we're planning dairy next and then maybe seafood. And so how are you how are you gauging whether they understood what you were saying? So you know it's it's hard it's hard to to know exactly what people are taking away from it. Um, my personal opinion is I think the producers that represented their industries did a really good job of breaking it down in a really simple way. And we do a lot of pre-conversation to help with that. Um, but I will say the, the questions, the follow-up questions we get from the Hill have all signaled to me that people are thinking about things differently than they maybe would have. Mm -hmm. And the stories that have come out in the, you know, mainly the ag media, but you know, in Bloomberg and some other publications, mm -hmm. I think have been much more thoughtful and much more, um, frankly, truthful about the food supply chain challenges than they maybe would have been. And, and we hope that we are impacting that a little bit when they're quoting our panelists. Sure. So when you did these presentations, were you also including a very specific ask? So, you know, we didn't, we haven't been including a specific policy ask per se. Mm -hmm. um, some of our individual producers in their individual industries needed things that maybe not everybody needs. So we said, you know, if there's something specific, for instance, the pork producer talked a lot, and this was before CFAP came out and before the indemnity payments came out, they were very vocal about needing. Um, assistance for both the cost of euthanization as well as the cost of burial for, mm -hmm. um, for hogs. Mm -hmm. So they took that and went with it. And, you know, I think members of Congress in the Hill heard that. Um, Cherry, the Cherry guy talked about the ripping out of, um, 
of trees and what that meant and sort of thinking through assistance in, in that in that space. So, um, you know, aside from thanking and additional PPP funding and, you know, thanking USDA and Congress for what they provided already, we mm -hmm. haven't made specific asks yet. Mm -hmm. And have you connected the producers and the people on the Hill to, I mean, you mentioned supply chain, which I understand, but have they made the connection to um, the food system in terms of dealing with food access and you know, food insecurity and all those are more of the sort of social economic when it comes to, you know, the regular, the other neighborhoods, because that's something that I'm trying to address here in Charlotte, but you can't do it exclusively. It has to be integrated as part of the entire message. Yeah, we did. Um, so particularly on the fruit and vegetable side, it's harder on the, the animal, the protein sector side, just, you know, what do you, you can't donate a whole hog. Um, but on the fruit and vegetable side, we did have a, a conversation about folks in Florida. So fruit and vegetables is, is different regionally, right? So a lot of people are just starting to harvest. So their ability to donate product that they can't sell to a food bank or to the food box program, et cetera, it, that hasn't occurred yet. And they don't know how much product they're going to have that they can't sell yet because they don't know what their contracts are going to end up. They know what their contracts are now, but they don't know how much of that contract is going to be honored. So um, the Florida, our Florida representative was great about explaining how he got lettuce into boxes for hospitals for first for frontline workers, how we got boxes to food banks, and how he got boxes to the community just basically said, a bunch of farmers came together, we all put fresh produce in a box, you line up with your car, we'll throw it in your trunk as you drive by, kind of thing. Um, but And there were some folks who expressed the challenges they're facing with the, the contracts that were given out for um, the USDA food bank program and kind of figuring out how to work through that and, and you know the you know some of the obstacles they were facing and getting their product into those boxes okay thank you yeah my pleasure it's a big it's a huge subject <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely and I'm happy to sort of walk through any of this more offline yeah, too talk later. That's, that's fantastic yeah that's great questions Barbara and great insights Jenny we certainly appreciate that um, all right, so Ryan, do we, yeah, there we go, okay, excellent. I'm still here, yeah. <laughs> I'll see if I can get my screen shared and, uh, get this going. All right, so I'm assuming that, that made it. Yep, we're seeing your cap row policy in COVID-19. All right. Well, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the talk, that's me. Thanks you all for having me on. Um, I wanted to start off with just a bit of a longer introduction to myself than I had up there at the beginning, uh, just to give you a little bit of context to where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm based in DC, but um, from actually uh, Northern California, that picture on the top left there is the Shasta Valley, that's Mount Shasta in Northern California. Uh, grew up in a town called Wairika. I was actually born in uh, Stockton, California, which is sort of the mouth of the Delta and the uh, kind of center of the Central Valley. So grew up in a lot of ag country, uh, first row crops and, and orchards and such, and then uh, moved up into a lot of ranch land. That's high desert up there. Um, so used to work a lot when I was young with the Shasta Valley Resource Conservation District. So it's pretty exciting to be talking to conservation district folks again. Uh, the picture there on the bottom right is um, a little more recent. Uh, this is uh, the mountains just outside of Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is where I did my PhD research. So I worked with farmers um, uh, just outside of the city of Sao Paulo, but a very rural place that's shifting around a lot between coffee, cattle, eucalyptus, and um, worked on kind of how to design programs similar to what NRCS has um, to pay farmers to protect water sources because this is where the city of Sao Paulo gets their drinking water. Uh, so you know grew up around ag even though I'm not actually from a ranching family or anything myself um, and then uh, have been trying to spend more of my career involved in that and actually uh, kind of as a result of this work in Brazil I crossed paths with NACD a couple of years ago if Jeremy would remember this or not, but their annual meeting 
uh, was out in West Virginia and it aligned with a conference on behavioral economics and ag. Uh, so first got to chat with folks there. So it's really nice to be uh, staying engaged with private lands conservation. So on to, to the Center for American Progress, your CAP uh, itself. Uh, for some of you, obviously, the reputation precedes it. That'd be looking at you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, your daughter works. Uh, we used to be off the page building mates, but now we all are scattered to the breeze yep. until whenever. Um, but this is our mission statement. I figured it's just kind of a nice summary of uh, what CAP defines itself as. The things that I'd like to uh, really emphasize here is that it's an independent, nonpartisan policy institute um, dedicated to improving the lives of all Americans through bold, progressive ideas. Uh, what that means, what I, why I gave that to you as some framing, is that while I've worked an awful lot, um, you know, in the weeds on the calculations or uh, say like a dairy farmer's got to make uh, in the hills out in Brazil, this is much more of a, a situation where we think at um, broader strokes uh, about what kinds of policies would be um, uh, would achieve sort of our it would match with our values or progressive values and then also satisfy uh, or be a solution to problems that we see. Another reason that we have this kind of high level um, approach is that we just cover a lot of issues uh, at CAP. We have teams working on economic policy, health policy. We have a women's initiative, which is uh, Barbara, I the team that Robin works on, right? Uh, we're in immigration policy. I myself am on the energy and environment team. We also have others that cover very focused policy issues, um, race, ethnicity, um, see, yeah, various of the poverty specifically. Um, so the energy environment team is about 25 people uh, split into two big groups, one of which focuses on climate, both international and domestic aspects of climate change and how to address it. And then my team, uh, which is a public lands team, sits under a conservation team. Uh, public lands, uh, is named that principally because their focus in the past has been on Department of Interior policy rather than USDA. I feel like I'm trying to shift that frame a little bit more to cover all lands uh, and really enjoy the opportunity to do so. Um, but because it, it started that way, uh, especially because of a federal focus, because it's a, a DC-based think tank, that's sort of how it's been structured in the past. Um, so I want to talk, also just give you a quick overview of uh, what I would have discussed a bit before, uh, before March. Um, you know, we had kind of these broad buckets correlated with those two different teams on, okay, what is a policy framework that would help us address climate change? Ours is sort of branded as a 100% clean future, which follows IPCC recommendations to try to uh, chart a path towards reducing our emissions um, to achieve that goal by 2050. Uh, the public lands team and the oceans team focused on a project that was kind of shaped around this motto of 30 by 30, uh, protecting 30% of US lands and oceans by 2030. Um, I'll talk a bit more about it, but that includes things like new national parks for sure, wildlife refuges and such, and, and stronger protections for federal lands. But I personally have also been working um, to try to figure out how we shape and define and better support uh, private lands conservation, be that through easements and through investments in restoration um, and uh, other ways to support rural livelihoods. So um, a couple of examples of work that we've done in the not so distant past, um, worked with a couple of colleagues of mine on a, a climate piece uh, very, very early in this year, which feels like forever ago. Um, specifically carving out you know, this 100% clean future future project took us several months to do. It was released fall of last year and that addresses things like electricity, transportation, industrial policy and all of this stuff but also covers uh, lands both agriculture and uh, conservation so things like national forests and such. Um, so worked a bit on, on what actually some of these recommendations, a lot of which are improving or increasing support for NRCS programs, uh, what that would do to support uh, agricultural communities specifically, but also forest and timber dependent communities as well. Um, so that's kind of an example of the analytical work that I would do. Um, the picture on the left there is, I think, kind of a neat partnership that's a little dated now, but uh, Kevin had mentioned the 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act, uh, 
you know, as those discussions were going on, um, we were looking at kind of the broad suite of issues within the farm bill that are important to different progressive uh, audiences, uh, nutrition title being one for sure, and conservation title um, being another. And had also, you know, we've, we've interacted in the past with other think tanks in, in the DC area, regardless of their sort of uh, maybe I perspective or lens through which they look at the world, right? And so our street institute, I'd probably not a very well-known organization like our, like we're all DC bubble E type organizations. And so, but uh, give you a quick summary of what our street is, is a, they're a free, free market think tank, uh, focused very much on um, smart spending from the federal government. And so we worked with them to think through, okay, what aspects of things like the regional conservation partnership program or other tools that the NRCS has, what do we both kind of feel makes a heck of a lot of sense after talking with folks that come from perspectives such as uh, as y'all, and then also um, just drawn from our own uh, backgrounds. So, you know, we do these different types of, of projects that really kind of, you know, focus on either what a lot of folks seem, their new ideas that, that need to get more attention and I, or their ideas that don't receive enough attention, which is that piece on the right there. Uh, or their kind of quick facts, like the additional $8 billion to rural communities comes from a combination of cost savings and also uh, uh, funding through NRCS, uh, through programs like Equip that you're already familiar with. So those are kind of the different levels that we, um, we tend to approach um, conservation. So uh, just wanted to give you that for some context. Um, now, you know, those, those different 2020 projects, they uh, definitely have been affected by COVID-19. And I think that, um, you know, we haven't necessarily uh, forgotten them, but there's uh, an awful lot of demand right now for folks, uh, similar to what Jenny had said, to be thinking very near term, how do we just get through this, right? And, and that's, um, less of an air less of a wheelhouse for the energy environment team i think specifically because a lot of folks are thinking about health care and health policy right now when do states open up how long do you stay closed what do you need in terms of testing you know that that's that's really taking up a lot of uh of folks time and then there's also the just un astounding uh economic impacts of of trying to contain this um, and so thinking about what unemployment supports would be necessary and for how long to try to, to help get a handle on stuff. Uh, but where it starts to become maybe a bit more related to the um, uh, places you all are coming from is, or at least from the areas, issue areas you all are coming from as, as folks are involved in um, uh, resource conservation work is, you know, what, what, are, what are ways that um, smart, spending and support to try to help get through this and, and um, make sure folks don't end up even worse off than they already are. Um, you know, where, what are those types of jobs? Where do they come from? And I think that that's one of the places where I see there being, you know, opportunities in the near term to uh, elevate, you know, solutions that address some of the, easement, uh, some of the issues that folks are, are uh, are facing in the agricultural community. I think that um, issues of, you know, things like conservation easements or other tools to try to get other, to get more cash in folks' pockets, for instance, are, is one way to do it. There's also investments in restoration and other uh, stewardship activities that I think uh, we'll be engaging with in the future that, um, yeah, try to, try to help folks out. Um, there's one thing I think I forgot to end up sliding in here, but I did give you a link for it, um, is that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we're a multiple issue think tank and there's so many different people working on so many different things. We don't necessarily get out of bubbles. We're on different floors in the same building. Even I, I like the women's initiative is, uh, nine floors, I think away from where I sit or when I used to sit in the office. Um, so we've actually started about a year and a half ago to at least have meetings with folks who work on rural issues specifically, uh, just because there is so much overlap, um, you know, that 
that it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for one hand to be talking about one thing, especially on like the economic policy team and not to be talking to someone like me, for instance, who works on uh, like forest restoration jobs, for instance, on national forest land or something like that. Um, so drop these links here and, and I'm happy to share them with folks in case they find them interesting, uh, just to get a sense of the kind of work that CAP is doing. Um, I would also just, if you all don't mind, put a personal plug in here at the end is that, you know, I, I, um, really value having grown up in the situations that I have. The Shasta Valley, for instance, is a really interesting case study in a number of different ways that folks have either come together or not to try to address resource uh, conservation concerns. Um, salmon and, and irrigation being one of the really big ones, right? Um, but, you know, I think that having that perspective has made my work or my contributions to CAP be a lot more valuable. And I love talking to folks about what they experience and see in other parts of the world. I, I know I saw someone from uh, from uh, Chattahoochee, right? So, you know, for instance, that's a whole different type of water conflict going on in that region. Uh, it's a much different uh, story from what you'd see in, in Missouri or, or Oklahoma, too. So, um, you know, if any of you all are interested in learning more, I'd love to chat and just hear about how things are going for you all, too, because I... I think that that's a really helpful thing for me professionally to know. So happy to take any questions from y'all. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Any questions for Ryan? I do. Um, there has been a lot of things in the news about um, the administration giving rights to corporations to blow up the Grand Canyon or all these different, these are crazy. I mean, this cap, weigh in on those kinds of things. I mean, I, I'm astounded that that's even, even a possibility. But again, you know, I personally do not believe in making public land private. Okay. I understand, you know, partnerships and funding and so forth, but I struggle with that, especially where here in Charlotte, there are different groups that, again, development and so forth, but they want to take public land and make it private. And I just struggle. Um, and when you see it on a grand scale, like in other places, I'm just curious, of CAP's position or if they have one on that? Uh, yes, certainly. We've, uh, we've been engaged in, in that issue, the uranium mining. Um, there had been a withdrawal on areas around the Grand Canyon and um, discussing lifting it, right? And that's, um, you know, certainly not something that we're supportive of. And I think that there's also a lot of uh, investment that like, folks have made on the ground just like to elevate what uh, is happening to communities in say like Navajo country, for instance, which is where a lot of the uh, impacts of uranium mining tend to have their health consequences. Um, you know, that, that I think we try to point out that this is not necessarily something that's supported by folks who are, who are on the ground, understanding that, you know, you do resources, but there's ways to go about it that don't involve cutting public, the public out of it, especially the people who are gonna be disproportionately impacted by that type of decision. There's other areas where, you know, like leasing for oil and gas on federal lands right now, and also some of the rule changes that have been moved forward, there are still appears to be a lot of momentum to try to close those out, even though no one can really comment right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And, um, you know, just pointing out that some of these things like, you know, are, are, um, could be a little bit more inclusive than they are, I would say. I have, a, I have a question for you, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Cassius. Go yep. ahead. Uh, um, so the last uh, last meeting we had, we talked a lot of, we had some pres uh, presenters that would talk a lot about uh, urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when listening to the uh, gentleman speak uh, uh, earlier today about, you know, there's something, I mean, a lot of things are changing some things they don't want to see change like you know uh being you know being on the, the the farmer's land you know and talking conservation with him right there it's kind of like the foundation of uh the, uh, the organization in nacd kind of like started off with uh an rcs and um so if you know if you're only as strong as your weakest link and things are changing now we've all seen that when something tanks something else is is growing fast and 
but if this is something new that we're not used to, you know, this, this coronavirus and all the different effects it has on the community, uh, then what is it that's, you know, spiking in, in this area? Um, and, you know, when you talk about world development, um, you know, it can't help me but think that even in a place of like New York City, for example, that we don't look as being rural, but in a sense, uh, it may be rural to things that we don't look at as happening there. So, uh, for example, I guess the best way to explain it, if you went down to the rural development office and you said, look, I, I could use a tractor or, or some kind of machinery or something uh, in the middle of New York City because I'm planning on being a producer there, uh, they were like, well, you don't meet our qualifications because it's not a rural area. Uh, but if you twist that and say, you know, the area may not be rural, but the need there is rural. You know, the, the, the growing uh, produce is rural there. So, so support that, like, like, let's flip this because of these changes and support the need of what has to happen in the area like that. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, I, think, but, I think I do maybe, and let me just like, uh, and just to clarify, like, is that a little bit of a thought that was triggered by the Rural America uh, kind of initiative that the sort of cross pollination thing I mentioned there at the end? Yeah. 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 So I think that one of the reasons that, um, uh, you know, we, we did this was certainly so that folks uh, in our own team started to talk to each other about what we were all working on in rural places. But I think that also, you know, we don't, uh, appreciate the the diversity of rural America and I think that's especially uh, tough in places where if someone say has spent their life living in a suburban or an urban place and, and sort of assumes that it's all corn country 100% like you know I've, rural parts of the Central Valley have much different needs from like say like the blues there that Ray's got in his background right or anything like that so there's I think that that in a sense it's meant to try to think about rural as something besides like a monolithic thing but i i also appreciate and and we certainly do um uh you know like i appreciate the fact that there are that it's all like a gradient right it's not like a a cut and dry distinction that you make and and um i'm not sure if that that totally answers your question because i'm not uh catching that like I'm not fully answering that last part about like rural development and quality like whether someone qualifies for support depending on where they are and um that might be like in practice a bit further in the weeds than they let us get a cap although I like that stuff uh, but hopefully that that is a helpful context for what I meant by that can I, can I add to that yeah Please. Sorry, I don't mean to jump in on your time, but because you mentioned sort of this dynamic of when there's a challenge in one part of agriculture, is there some opportunities in others? Um, what I can tell you is through talking to a lot of our customers who are on the outskirts of, a, of an urban area, like right outside of Austin or um, right outside of Atlanta, some of these folks that are have diversified operations where they're doing CSAs or um, you know, their model is already direct farm pickup to more or urban populations. Even if some of their business had been to restaurants or even if 50 or 60% of their business has been to restaurants, the way that they're set up, they have really easily been able to shift into direct to consumer sales. And I talked to a couple of folks who I approached on to be on a panel for us about specialty crops. And they were like, I'm not comfortable being on a panel because we're doing so well right now. We're turning customers away. So there's, there are bright spots here of folks that are being really nimble, really adept at responding to consumer needs and wants. And a lot of that is happening right next to very urban centers. That's exactly what we have here in Mecklenburg County exactly what you described right yeah. and, and it's right wrong or indifferent it's almost like why waste a good pandemic i mean when this yeah. has occurred the food system came to light and these small farmers that are doing regenerative whatever and the csa just skyrocketed and so but but they still have huge needs huge huge needs and that's where i guess all the other dynamics that you introduced come into play um, and there are many that for whatever reason don't 
think they qualify, the cash assistance with your point, they don't think they qualify for some of the NRCS programs for whatever reason, and they probably do, right? And so this is, has presented an opportunity for us to reach out and bring the resources and say, you do qualify. You can get this loan or you can't, what, what have you. Um, it's very one interesting. Of our, one of our cohorts, Sam, is actually living this. Uh, I invite Sam to unmute and give us a little update on how things are going at your place. Yeah, so um, I have a waiting list of people trying to get beef. Uh, I mean, cows only grow so fast, you can only process so many. <laughs> the hard part is getting butcher dates for things. Um, I raised 1,200 chickens last year. I'm up to 2,800 chickens already this year. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're right outside of, I'm stuck between Cincinnati and Dayton, so two really big cities. People have figured out that the grocery stores aren't able to supply their needs, so they're coming to me. And me and a couple other local farmers are doing our best to get people what they need. I have partnered with some people who raise pigs, um, an Amish family who raises grass-fed lamb, and so have been started that partnership with them to be able to get everybody what they're looking for. So, yeah. And, that, and, that, and exactly what my point is that, you know, uh, buy and demand, if there's a lot of people that see what you're doing and they want to help and want to be able to do that as well, um, and we're lacking in other areas or we have a, a, a supply of you know tools that we're not using, then why not give it to these folks that could use this and want to be involved? And because that message is going to even spread even further and we get more people understanding conservation, understanding what clean water and, and clean soil is all about. And again, it's just opening up those doors for them. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, and I see the same thing here and I can tell you the folks here are exhausted, you know, and I've said, well, if somebody is exhausted, then that means there's room for more growth. There's room mm -hmm. for, for more. And there's still people going without, and there's still people that, you know, want to get involved to help, or if it's just for their own benefit. Uh, but regardless, they're going to learn. They're going to learn more about what we do and what we offer. Mm. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great content and great discussion. Um, Coleman, we would love to be able to hear your insights on some of this stuff too. So um, we'll shift to you now. We're a little, we're a little behind, but um, we uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, uh, happy to join y'all. Again, I'm Coleman Garrison. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the National Association of Conservation Districts. Uh, been here right around four years now, spent some time on Capitol Hill working for various members doing ag work and uh, transitioned over here when my boss uh, decided to retire in 2016, which for anyone else I'm in the DC world who has worked on the Hill knows that you're only there as long as your boss is either winning or deciding to run. Uh, so really enjoyed my time at NACD and really enjoyed the chance to talk with y'all today. Uh, like I mentioned, I've worked with several of y'all in various capacities through NACD and my presentation will be maybe a little bit different uh, because we are your conservation district's national association. Uh, we are here to represent you um, and your views and policies and needs. Uh, certainly my, my presentation will be a little different and, than it would have been two or three months ago as everyone else has, and I'll probably try to go uh, a little quickly uh, just to kind of hit some of the high points, but uh, really just want to spend some time with y'all talking about um, kind of what NACD focuses on generally uh, what we've been working on lately as it relates to the kind of the COVID-19 crisis and kind of how we utilize our grassroots efforts and y'all on the ground, our board members, our districts, our state associations to help you advocate on your behalf, but also to help educate us and then thus educate members of Congress and uh, people in the administration like NRCS and FSA about the things that uh, y'all need on the ground. So give me just a second, let me share my screen.
Has that worked for y'all? Not yet. Not yet. No. Oh, there we go. I didn't actually click share. That's probably helpful. Okay, it's coming into view now. We good? Yeah, yes. there we go. Okay. And before you start, I'll go ahead and remind everybody to mute yourselves so that we've got the little clear background. Okay, great. So I was going to spend some time kind of just Azure National Association doing a quick uh, civics lesson about what we do, how the policy process works. Um, I'll kind of do that quickly. As you all know, House Senate uh, works together with the administration to pass laws. Uh, you'll hear a lot recently about the House passed a bill to help the, the COVID crisis and the Senate's not doing it or the Senate's doing this. Um, so this process here is in an ideal world. Things are moving much differently than normal. Um, but you have the basic legislative process helping you work with your members of Congress as well as the executive process, which is where Kevin Norton is housed and where we uh, do public comments uh, and working with it to make sure the programs passed by Congress are working the best for you. Uh, so for y'all, advocacy is really just telling Congress what's important to you. Uh, as you've heard a couple times already from other organizations, uh, someone is always advocating uh, on behalf of their members. They may not be advocating for what districts need or want. So it's important to make sure your story is being told. Uh, and probably the most important thing that I'll communicate through this entire thing is that relationships matter more than people think. Um, relationships where a member and their staff know what districts are, that's sometimes very much the first thing that we have to do is educate folks what are conservation districts. Um, because sometimes the problem is they call them soil and water conservation districts in one state and resource conservation districts in another state. Uh, so they have to ask, is that what you're referring to here? And then one thing we've definitely run into recently is educating folks that districts are government entities. Uh, we are local units of government as created by state statutes, uh, which uh, provide certain benefits, but also some potential hurdles and roadblocks uh, as Congress is looking to pass things to support uh, folks on the ground. Um, and rural America certainly is uh, more and more running into uh, issues where they do not have as much representation in Congress. And uh, for the most part, our members are located in rural America um, and even in places where they are maybe more suburban and urban uh, with the growing need of urban agriculture and direct to consumer agriculture, you are seeing more needs for people in Congress to know uh, how their food is produced and knowing what happens in uh, agri agriculture industry. Um, so we're gonna have in the next census uh, a redistricting across the country. Uh, my old member of Congress represented West Texas and uh, represented a district that is larger than six states, physically speaking. Um, and in the next district, that district, or next redistricting, that district will probably add another three to four counties, uh, meaning that uh, in Texas, where I'm from, you'll have the DFW in the Houston area, it's probably adding two or three uh, members of Congress to them, while rural districts are just increasing the size but not increasing in representation. Um, and additionally, we see more and more uh, that as this map shows, the red being Republicans and blue Democrats, is that in the areas that most people consider rural America and agriculture focused, uh, the party representation is certainly uh, realigning where most uh, rural America is represented by uh, Republicans um, and most urban areas represented by Democrats. And that certainly uh, provides different challenges when it comes to educating folks and convincing members of Congress how they should or shouldn't vote and support various issues. So why care about policy? Um, as the Director of Government Affairs, I am leading a team at NACD to uh, make sure that the policies and the bills and the programs that are being created or reauthorizing through Congress uh, meet the needs of conservation districts and the unique needs across the country of different conservation districts. Uh, the Farm Bill is probably the one we spend the most time talking about um, and focused on. It is certainly not the only uh, large piece of legislation or issue area. Uh, conservation districts work a lot with uh, interior agencies and Fish and Wildlife Service and EPA as well, but certainly the Farm Bill is 
uh, probably more than anything else, the bread and butter of what we are working on because it does authorize many of the programs the conservation districts then help implement uh, in their local office. Um, kind of skip some of this a little bit, um, but to help kind of break down a little more of what Kevin said earlier about conservation spending in a larger farm bill, um, you can see in this chart projected 10 year spending from the 10 year or over the next 10 years from the 2018 farm bill. And as Kevin saw, or as Kevin showed, the vast majority is going to the nutrition programs, uh, the SNAP program at USDA um, with commodity crop insurance and conservation programs making up a smaller point. But of the kind of farm, quote unquote, farm bill dollars, and sorry, I'm just realizing this chart is way uh, out of whack when it comes to uh, the graphics, but uh, you'll see that it's about split, a third, third, and a third between the commodity, the conservation, and the crop insurance programs. Um, so even amongst the very small 25% or so share of the quote unquote farm parts, conservation receives about a third of that. But that has been growing over the course of the years, and certainly the way those programs uh, are funded within the conservation title has changed quite a bit as well. Uh, this chart shows a little bit uh, about how conservation programs are broken down within the conservation title, um, or at least the spending for those. You can see 15, 20, 25 years ago, the CRP program uh, by far was the main program that was considered a conservation program uh, within the Farm Bill. But as direct cost share and support to farmers implement conservation practices rather than set aside has become more popular, uh, you've seen the EQIP program, the CSP program, the ASAP and the RCPP program uh, definitely start to take more of that share of the conservation title. Um, and right now I'd probably say the EQIP program as we hear from conservation districts are kind of the workhorse of the direct conservation uh, programs out there. We also focus on appropriations, the annual budgeting cycle. Certainly that is something we would be probably spending more time on right now uh, if COVID were not occurring. Um, but it is still something Congress is still taking place. They are still working their way through the appropriations process, maybe not as publicly as they would have otherwise before now. Um, but the programs that NACD cares about, the Conservation Technical Assistance Program, the EPA 319 program, all have to be paid for annually through the appropriations process uh, in order for them to continue at those respective agencies. So making sure that we are communicating to Congress what those needs are and how much money we think is appropriate is something that is always taking place and something we would have been equipping y'all to do during our fly-in had that taken place. Uh, I want to also really quickly brief y'all on our NACD policy process. Since y'all are all local supervisors, some of y'all are board members, I think kind of the large 30,000 foot picture of what we hope out of this NGLI process is that we are, again, equipping the future leaders of conservation districts and the future leaders of NACD uh, to be more aware and to be better educated on what NACD is doing, and kind of at least from the DC aspect of things that I work on, why we do what we do and how we go about doing what we do. Uh, so NACD relies on our grassroots policy process uh, to work on various programs. When someone comes to me uh, and says, we are thinking of introducing this bill that would do X, Y, Z, uh, we literally do refer to our policy book and find areas that either supports or opposes uh, what that bill would do or what that program would do or what that idea would do and those policies are developed at the local level and can be offered by states, one of NACD's seven regions or a foundation committee within NACD in order to be considered by the various foundation committees and the full board at our annual meetings each winter. Um, policies can be responding to a current issue such as EQIP isn't working in my area because of XYZ and NACD should support changing it, or it can be a general statement that NACD supports cost share programs. Um, both can be beneficial as we work on various policy areas in Washington, DC, uh, but as we sometimes run into, policies must deal with conservation in some sort of context. Uh, that can sometimes be difficult when uh, our members who are many times farmers themselves or involved in the agriculture industry uh, want us to work on uh, a type of agriculture policy 
if it doesn't have to do with conservation as NACD is there to represent the districts themselves, uh, while we are, of course, generally supportive of agriculture and much of the work that the other presenters have already talked about here, um, we do try to keep to our lane as much as possible and focus on conservation related issues. And certainly you can make an argument that so much of it has to do with conservation. If farmers aren't able to keep their books in order and stay operating, then they're not gonna be able to implement conservation practices and who knows what may happen to that land. Uh, but we do try to stay within our lane because we do view ourselves as the experts, uh, generally speaking, on conservation programs uh, across the country. We don't focus on just wildlife or just ranching or just grasslands. Uh, we focus on everything under the sun when it comes to conservation. Um, so when a policy is passed, NACD is responsible for implementing that, whether it's trying to get a letter written, uh, a bill introduced, a program changed, whatever that route is, uh, NACD is tasked with doing that. Uh, but it is a concert conversation uh, between the local and national level. I can say right now we are in the mental of implementing pro uh, policies that are passed in our annual you know, meeting in Las Vegas. And I am reaching out to uh, the states on the ground that originally implemented this uh, to figure out what they want done. Um, so yeah wrap this up in the next two or three minutes Sunny, uh, for y'all um, but in a normal time advocacy is meeting in DC setting up a, a tour back home to show your members and maybe even your local county commissioners and your state legislatures what it is you are doing um, relationships are vital uh, I love when I talk to a maybe a state executive director or a state board member and they say hey I can go email or I can call Bob and Senator Blank's office about this um, I can be your best advocate in the world in Washington, D.C., but having that local uh, expertise and having someone who has the, uh, the local knowledge and actually working on the land to say the same thing is vital to me being able to do what I'm doing uh, because they give me credence and what I'm doing is the right thing. Um, and then on the... Uh, executive side, participating in public comments is also vital as the, as NRCS has worked over the last uh, six months or so, releasing uh, public comment periods for the various programs and having districts respond what's working and what's not. So in the current, what we're working on, I think the biggest challenge we've had in ACD is not so much figuring out what districts are working on, but really figuring out what districts, how they are funded and how they are created. Uh, many Many times uh, we found that programs like the Paycheck Protection Program don't work for conservation districts because they are not small businesses, they're not nonprofits, they are local government entities and are not eligible. The tax credits for um, family and sick leave that were passed in the, I think the third or the second uh, stimulus package, not eligible for local governments, which means districts are not eligible for that. So really trying to kind of rush up on our knowledge of kind of what districts are because we do a good job knowing what they do and how they work with landowners, but kind of just the structural form of what districts are has been a challenge. Uh, but also helping uh, coordinate conversations, again, between local districts and state associations and their members of Congress. We had a kind of virtual fly-in when this was all first starting, encouraging folks to reach out on our normal appropriations requests and normal issues. But really over the last month, month and a half, we've really also been trying to encourage districts and state associations to keep up conversations, let your state representatives, or let your, your states, your senators and your representatives know, here's what's happening with districts in my state. We are funded mostly by the county or mostly by the state, or in some cases, we're not funded at all by the county or the state. So these are the challenges, these are the pressure points we are dealing with as we are trying to continue to meet our mission um, to deliver conservation on a local level. Uh, so we are continuing to kind of keep those conversations going. Certainly, if any of your states or districts want help or ideas, I'm happy to talk with any of y'all about that. Um, but uh, I'll probably end it there. Uh, hopefully, I didn't go too long, Sunny. Um, happy to answer questions. But again, as y'all's national association to represent you, uh, we just want to continue to be there for you to be a resource to help advocate on behalf of yourself. Thank you, Coleman. Any questions for Coleman? Barbara, I think 
Uh, you're on mute. Got it, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, can you give an example of a policy that you advocated for that ultimately, I'll say trickled down, I don't like to use that term, but down to the state level, and I'll say it's successfully. And the reason I, I caveat is one of the issues that we're dealing with for my board is insurance coverage. And the state statute, and our states are all different, that's what makes it interesting. The state statute specifically says that we can sue or be sued, okay? And yet we have, it's very unclear, no one has ever answered the question about our liability, professional liability, directors of you know, insurance and, and general liability, okay? And we're sort of pushing that now with our association to try to get answers because we have no funding. And so I'm curious if that subject has even reached your level. And if not, you know, I'm just wondering what other, what other issues have you been successfully been able to wrestle with and help us? Yeah, um, I, think I don't know a whole lot about that issue. I'm not sure it has reached me personally. I'm not saying it hasn't reached someone else within NACD, sure. um, but not myself personally. And that is really one of the, you mentioned one of the challenges we have because districts were created by state statute in their individual states, not only are they called different things, but they have legal, different legal jurisdictions. Yes. Some states have the authority to do permits and they can do fee for service for stormwater permits. Some have taxing authority. Um, I would say to that specific concern, that may be more of a state issue based on what state, how your state statute created North Carolina conservation districts um, and what your liabilities are and what may you may have, you may, your district may not have an insurance policy itself, but perhaps your state conservation agencies, liability protections um, cover you. Um, I am so far away from not being a lawyer. I couldn't <laughs> uh, really speak to much more than that, um, but happy to offline chat about it more. Okay, that's um, fine. I just thought I would ask. Yeah, we're we're yeah. going down that path, but it's, it's a big deal. So. And Coleman yeah. answered that very well. This is Ray, and uh, I would just say check with your state conservation agency first, as Coleman has suggested. Mm -hmm. You're going to know whether or not you have a risk management agency within North Carolina that assists with that type of uh, work. And if you need, uh, Coleman, I'll offer myself too, if we need to reconnect back in with the NASCA folks, State Conservation Agency folks, Barbara, we can do that. Yep, thank you. Yep. Well, let's uh, give all of our speakers a round of applause. Thank you, excellent. On our virtual, um, Coleman and Ryan and Jenny and Kevin, it was exceptional content and certainly um, relevant and it was a nice uh, reminder of uh, how great it will be to actually see you in person at some point um, when all of this settles out and we can take a deeper dive into the work that you do. So thank you very much. So um, we usually transition to our cohort roundtable at this point. So speakers, if uh, you want to step out. Um, this is a chance for the cohort to kind of connect with each other and um, discuss what's going on with them at the local level. And um, yeah, again, thanks to the speakers. That was, it was really quite outstanding. Thanks. Thank you. A pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your thank you willingness very... to join us. Outstanding.